Hey, so um, welcome everyone to this uh, exciting event. My name is Seraphim Alvanides. I'm based at Kisses. And first of all, I would like to tell you that uh, the event is being recorded. So if anyone wishes not to be seen in the recordings, etc., please switch off your cameras. And if you don't want to be heard, please do not voice, uh, but you can ask questions or participate through the chat. And um, because this will be saved separately and we can remove comments, etc., cetera, from, from that. So as I said, I'm uh, Seraph Malvanides, and uh, I would like to welcome you to this uh, exciting event. And um, it is not a single uh, effort. As you can see here, I am a member of the Journal's outreach group, team, partners uh, from SESTA. And uh, you can see here um, all the people participating, contributing, and uh, delivering material for the effort, for the General's Outreach effort, as well as contributing to these uh, events. So I would like to, first of all, thank my partners for their very kind contributions and uh, participation in general to all the activities that you will see um, following. I would like to say a few words about SESTA and the SESTA Consortium, because uh, some of you may uh, be new to this or may not have um, heard of the of SESTA, very unlikely, but in any case. And um, you can see here the vision uh, is to provide access to social science data and metadata and um, additional services to data producers, the people producing the data, whether it is researchers or um, national archives collecting data or organizations. And it says that adheres to the FAIR principles, the findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable data. And one important aspect of SESTA is also to provide training and enable transfer of expertise, not only between um, the service providers and the researchers, but also between the service providers themselves, uh, as well as with other organizations. And uh, you can see here very briefly the mission of SESTA um, to provide the research infrastructure, enable the research community to um, um, conduct high quality research in social sciences and in some cases in humanities as well, and facilitate teaching and learning in the social sciences. SESTA has a number of supporting um, of services supporting research, and you can see here some of the tools. For example, the data catalog, the European question pack, the resource directory, etc. And it adheres to um, trusts and standards. It has a core trust seal. And I would like to say a couple of words about the SESTA catalog. It's, uh, it aggregates information from all the, the service data providers. So you can um, have a single point of contact where you can search the various studies and then follow them up with data metadata, and potentially, in some cases, uh, links to publications as well. And finally, um, on the SESTA front, this is uh, one of the events organized under the training umbrella, and SESTA provides, uh, provides a whole range of training events. And you can see here the forthcoming ones. Well, we, are, we appear here, and there is a past event. But if you want more information, please go to this uh, website, and the events are free to attend in most cases, as far as I'm concerned, and many or most of the events these days are taking place online. So moving on, um, in relation to today's event, here's the program. I will go through it very, very briefly. Uh, first, I will uh, give a presentation about the General Outreach Group, what we have done, what we have achieved um, of the past uh, three years or so and also what uh, the plans are for the future. And at 2.20, uh, Brian Clair, my colleague from FORCE, will take over as moderator for two presentations, uh, 20 minutes each. And then we will have a 10 minute break. And then Mariana Klavica from, um, will take over for the next uh, hour or so for, with three presentations. So we have in total five presentations from non, oh well, not non sesta but external speakers to this uh, to this group. And finally, uh, Janis Stebe 
will um, moderate a 20 minute discussion, general discussion at the end of towards the end of the event, and then we will close by 4.30. And uh, I will ask you all to be quite strict with the times so that we don't get ourselves very exhausted. So a few words about the journal's outreach activities. For the next 10 minutes, I will give you a short presentation about what we have, how we started, what we achieved, and where we are going. Phase one um, was uh, part of the SESTA Work Plan 2020. So we came together in 2020, uh, the group of people working around uh, widening activities and journal's outreach. And uh, we started with internal meetings, shaping the terms and deliverables, and then we um, prepared three reports based on different ways of collecting and analyzing data that I will present very briefly. And uh, we concluded 2020 with a final report internal to SESTA related to engaging with uh, journals. So in terms, first of all, of the collaboration and the deliverables, and the overall aim was to get a better understanding of general practices, requirements, and needs. Uh, and the idea was to um, find ways to access uh, more readily the data used in scientific publications, both uh, uploading, making the data available um, to data archives, making the data visible, and uh, all this in uh, conversation and collaboration with journals. The second aim was to assess the CESA service provider capacities, the, the groups that you saw earlier, the members, the observers, and the partners, and in relation to policies and services responding to the needs of the journals for short and long-term preservation of data. And we also had uh, under our remit to study policy and legal issues, explore different models on how SESTA and service providers could coordinate and engage to offer better services. And the final deliverable was uh, from 2020 was to promote a SESTA related position statement and taking all these aspects into account. I will go very briefly through the three reports that are already available online, so I will not go in great depth, just to give you a flavor of how we approached uh, these issues. The first one was an assessment of general requirements and needs. So we focused in this case on the journals themselves. And um, we first of all looked at three global publishers, Elsevier, Sage and Springer, and we assessed whether the essential and the desirable characteristics that uh, appear in the literature in relation to data were, um, were met by the service provider side. So for example, essential criteria like clear data reuse and access conditions and existing support, as well as desirable criteria like um, standard data and, and metadata formats, data citation reports and versioning sustainability, certification and data contact information. And um, we established that uh, most of these essential and desirable characteristics are fulfilled by uh, most of the SESTA service providers. And this is the map you saw earlier. In addition, we had interviews with seven social science journal editors and we focused on three aspects. First of all, the current journal policies and on data sharing, so what sort of uh, policies they implement in their journals. Uh, secondly, perceptions uh, in relation to data sharing, depositing and archiving. And uh, thirdly, um, how we can support them as service providers in terms of their future policies. And as you can see here very briefly, um, although the journals have implemented coherent data sharing policy, um, or, or at least some of them, um, they are, the, the editors were quite concerned, or at least some of them, uh, they expressed conflicting views in relation to qualitative social science data because they impose additional challenges, for example, confidentiality and replicability issues. Um, in terms of their perceptions for data sharing, although all the editors we interviewed were sharing and were very positive about sharing data and they have done it themselves. Um, 
a couple of them did express uh, some concerns, again, in relation to the qualitative data that I mentioned earlier. And uh, finally, in terms of the support that uh, the editors felt that was necessary, um, there was, first of all, um, the need for support with designing clear data sharing policies and um, specific to the social sciences, because we can find data sharing policies around for the broader sciences, but they highlighted that in some cases, um, these need to be revisited and re reworked for specific for um, the specific uh, needs of social sciences. And in addition, they mentioned that uh, they felt the need for support to be authors to be offered to authors for handling data archiving processes and uh, alongside metadata and contextual information. And this leads to research data management training for authors and researchers and for data that is suitable for archiving and sharing. So they highlighted basically um, the need for exchange of information and exchange of good practice and training amongst the service providers and also the authors stroke researchers. The second deliverable or report uh, was in relation to assessing the service provider capacities. So we uh, ran a survey back in September 2020, and we received responses from 19 of the 22 SESTA members. And here it is briefly outlined, although you can uh, follow up the full report, it's now available on Zenodo um, in its, um, with all the graphs, etc. Uh, the two or three things I would like to highlight is um, that most of the service providers uh, meet the basic needs for general. So they are um, they, they have the capacity and uh, services to archive data short and long term. But in terms of how they themselves perceive the need for or rank the importance of different services as incentives for authors to deposit data, they put uh, most of them put uh, the emphasis on long-term curated data collections. So, um, so the emphasis here was not only the large studies and long-term curation, but also the individual researcher studies, the need for uh, long-term preservation, and the versioning of for data sets. And at the bottom, you can see the training, advice, and active support for data management and research data management uh, training. And on the right-hand side, you can see some of the limitations that the, the service providers expressed. For example, and with blue here, you have uh, no limitations at all. With orange, uh, potential limitations, and with yellow, we don't know, and great strong limitations. But what is interesting here is under B, the data from projects not funded by specific funding sources uh, or depository institutional background. So in general, data coming from um, all sorts of valid research, the service providers have no limitations or most of them have no limitations in archiving and supporting this kind of, um, this kind of service. What um, was um, more interesting is that although they expressed no limitations in uh, archiving and providing code and syntax for preparing the data and for reproducing the analysis, at the same time, most of them felt that um, this was not necessarily, as you can see on the left hand side, this was not necessarily a big incentive for the researchers themselves, for the authors and researchers. Uh, subsequent uh, discussions and analysis, um, um, re uh, we realized that this is not necessarily the case, that the, the, the researchers and the authors are actually incentivized to, to use um, the data service, the service providers um, of SESTA if they also provide uh, services for application. Uh, some of the challenges and concerns they raised that uh, data based on secondary sources and data from foreign sources um, with no connection to a specific archive is very difficult to then uh, support in some cases anyway. Um, these are national archives and when people or researchers come from other countries, 
and some of the respondents felt it may be better to redirect them to their own national archive rather than archive the data in a different country because in some cases it creates additional problems with language settings etc and some of the uh, service providers mentioned that we cannot accept all data linked to articles uh, even for particular journals because some of the data come from fields other than social sciences. I mentioned earlier, for example, humanities or historical data, images, et cetera. But uh, the service providers may not have the capacity um, or the uh, expertise to handle. And um, finally, one of the issues that was raised um, repeatedly was that it is not clear to many of the service providers responding to our survey on what basis specific journals include or exclude data archives in the list of preferred repositories. And this is something that uh, will be highlighted later today through our presentations as well. I will not go in depth into the third one on the recommendations for uh, services to journals because the views expressed there were generally very positive. And this was a follow-up focus group with six service providers from the survey and although they highlighted some of the issues that I mentioned earlier in relation for example to social and to qualitative data and um, they felt strongly that uh, in general the service providers are in a good position to support journals and also that CESDA as an organization should take the initiative to promote and these kind of services and the dialogue with journals. And the final deliverable from 2020 was a, a more of a strategic report that analyzed all this information from the different perspectives. So from the perspective of journals, publishers, editors, uh, service providers, and um, it subsequently informed the CESDA Agenda 21-22 for the journals outreach. And this is what I prevent in, uh, I will present in the next two minutes or so. So the second phase uh, that ran in 21 and 22 focused on a number of training events and, and then on some of the aspects that were highlighted in 2020, in particular, um, the exchange of expertise and uh, training in a broader sense um, for example, with the development of a data, data archiving guide chapter and um, outreach activities and help desk support. I will go through them very, very quickly. First of all, the outreach events. You can see here the links to the publications and uh, the presentations and the videos. There was an open forum looking at challenges for sharing data back in June 21. And uh, that consisted, in addition to a presentation from us, also short presentations from publishers, editors, researchers, and service providers. And in November 21, there was a workshop on looking at how we can make uh, social science research transparent and how transparency works in practice with five presentations from different aspects of research transparency. And in June 22, we presented um, at the panel at the ISIS conference in Gothenburg our joint efforts to support journals in data sharing and reproducibility. And you can find the uh, presentations from six of the service providers in this link. In addition, and uh, the other activities from this group are updating the journals uh, outreach SESTA website that you can see here and um, there are seven pilots from each one from each one of us uh, regarding engagement and experiences and future plans with uh, journals there is a chapter for the data archiving guide uh, currently being completed looking at how we handle reputation materials as service providers and the lessons we've learned and um, we are aiming to continue growing and maintaining the journal's outreach mailing list. So please um, join us here for discussions around matters related to data sharing with journals. And um, finally, um, we are currently preparing comprehensive profiles 
of the various SESTA pro service providers and that demonstrate our capacities and resources for supporting scientific journals. And this is again an invitation to participate. We will contact the service providers um, in due time. So to wrap up my um, talk, uh, just very briefly, I will hand over now to Brian and the discussion for this session as well as for other sessions will mostly be in the end. Um, so Brian Kleiner will um, take over now for the next 40 minutes or so with two presentations. Thank you. Okay, hi everybody. I'm Brian Kleiner from FORCE in Lausanne and we're also a partner in the SESTA Journals Outreach Project. Um, for this session leading up until the end of this hour, we, we had planned for two presentations. However, I still have not seen the second presenter. So we just have to be a bit flexible. Maybe this will allow us to address um, at some point during the hour, the question, the question from Peter Dorn um, that entered into the chat, but um, it, which is an interesting one. Um, but Peter, since you are the first presenter, maybe I ask I can ask you to um, to um, to step in um, to um, bring up your presentation. Can you now we can me? now we can hear you fine. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I will save my question for later, right? Yes, let's and do your presentation begin. first and then if we have time we come back to we come back to it. Let me see if I manage to share my screen. Is the screen visible to everybody? Yes. 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 Okay. <clears throat> okay, then I begin. Uh, thank you very much for uh, inviting me. Um, despite the fact that I'm uh, officially retired and I now have the status of a fellow uh, at DANS, uh, after having been uh, director of DANS for about uh, 15 years, uh, I'm spending most of my time now on uh, on other kinds of, uh, of things, um, such as research on Greek settlement history. Uh, but that's not the topic of today. Um, but as a dance fellow, I still work on a couple of subjects uh, voluntarily. And one of these subjects is um, uh, what we have been doing uh, together with uh, Leen Breur and Hans Voorbij for a couple of years, um, which was related to the research data journal uh, for the humanities and social sciences on which uh, Ulbe will give later on a presentation, so I will be short on, short, uh, on the, uh, the data journal, uh, but focus more on something that um, is related to that, um, uh, which is on data showcases. And actually my presentation um, is based on a forthcoming article, to a large extent based on a forthcoming article in the International Journal for Digital Curation, a publication by the Digital Curation Center, which, uh, which has the same title as the presentation of today, namely uh, on the data journal in a multimodal world. Uh, the article was uh, uh, written uh, together with Leen Breure, who uh, should get the credits for having done the majority of the work, and Hans Voorbij. Um, and uh, Lane is also present uh, here today. Uh, I saw so if there are questions, he can perhaps help me in, in answering them. The article is accepted, but not yet published. Uh, we are uh, waiting for it, uh, for the publication in the journal. I provide a link there. Um, I'm looking there almost every day to see if it is there, but so far not yet. Uh, we hope it will appear at least before the end of the year. Um, briefly, an overview, and I'm not going to repeat, of course, everything that is in the article. You will be able to read that if it, as soon as it appears. Um, but this is an overview of the contents, and I will be talking on a couple of things related to what is in the article, but not uh, replicating exactly its, uh, its contents. So 
Um, it says something on uh, what we named the exhibit of data sets. It gives something on the objectives. I will say something on that uh, a bit later on. Uh, the technical aspects um, will not be dealt with uh, today. Uh, you will have to read the text for that. Um, I will come back to a couple of um, important points that we uh, put under the discussion. Um, and uh, then we present a kind of conceptual model for this type of um, data publication. Um, and uh, I will end with something that is not in the paper, but a kind of a broader outlook of how this all fits in the broader publication package, as, as I call it. Um, I must also say that I gave a couple of earlier presentations, uh, both in this context here in 2020 and 21, um, and one together with Louise Quarty um, in an ISIS international conference. Um, and if you are interested in that, um, please mail me and I can um, send you those public, uh, those uh, presentations. Um, yes, um, but uh, of course it is inevitable because I, I'm assuming that not, not everybody uh, that is present today heard those early presentations. So I will reuse two or three slides from uh, the earlier presentations today. Uh, one of which is this one. Um, because I should say a, a few words at least on what those showcases are and what they aim at. You could say that um, um, both data articles in a data journal, but that will be dealt with, with uh, by Ulbe, I suppose, uh, and showcases aim for giving something extra on if you compare that with how data is present in data archives. And uh, a few of the things that they aim for is for a much, let's say, better presentation and uh, to showcase the, the gems in the data collections of, of archives, um, thereby improving um, the possibilities for reuse and usability of the data. Because the traditional data documentation is rather standard and is not always clear, especially not for the non-initiated. Um, it provides also use user ex experiences and, and by, by providing examples of the use. And uh, it also links to data evaluations or data reviews. This was dealt with in uh, my last year's uh, presentation. So objectives of data showcases are to raise attention, to improve the fairness, to provide coherence, to put the data into context, uh, doing that in a way that uses different modalities and different um, uh, means. So not only if, if, if data is just tabular, it still might, may help to provide additional like visual materials or videos or uh, what have you to generate more trust in the data, and of course also to enhance the transparency of the data. So um, you could say that um, data sets can appear in different ways. Um, in the data archive on the left side of the screen here, you cannot see the whole picture. And this, this is a case of a, a data set from um, the UK data archive. Um, I should also say this um, exhibit of data sets is not linked to any particular um, data archive. And it even doesn't need to be connected to just a particular data journal. It could be used in a more wider sense. Um, but a data set in the archive is, provides typically an overview of, let us say, core characteristics using uh, a standard metadata schema. Um, um, but it's, let us say, re relatively um, official. Um, you might even call it a bit bureaucratic. Um, and this is perhaps also why researchers do not like uh, so much 
to fill out all this, um, uh, this metadata often. In a data paper, you have the uh, researchers have the, the, the opportunity to, to give a much more uh, in-depth view on of what the data is about, how it was collected and so on in, a, in, a, in, the, in the form of a story. And the data exhibit, the showcases in the data exhibit provide um, more the look and feel of the data set, so to say. Um, they give a more condensed view than a data article, uh, but provide also access to the additional materials, the supplementary materials that, that are available or previews of the data and also can link to data reviews, for instance. Uh, this is just another um, um, view of the previous slide. Uh, and it gives the idea that those different things should, of course, be interconnected. And so far, they, they are interconnected by links in this particular case of the research data journal for the humanities and social sciences and the exhibit of data sets and the data archives in which the data, the actual data uh, are stored. Uh, but that are, is very simple links. The integration is, is let us say, uh, not very clear. Um, towards the end of the, of the article, we, um, we discuss a couple of challenges related to those uh, uh, showcases. It's paragraph four in the article, if you uh, uh, will read it later on. Um, and it, it, it discusses a number of um, subjects um, ranging from the format, the first issue, and there I'm very short uh, because there is all kinds of forms uh, possible for showcases. It depends a lot on the, the kind of data, what kind of showcase is useful. Um, the scalability is a very important subject because to make a showcase is, of course, additional work. And um, the question is, uh, in how far is that feasible? And isn't that too costly? Um, if you would like to do that for every data set in a data archive, it's probably not feasible. But you could do that for a selection of, let us say, the gems um, or apply it to uh, collections or larger projects. And also, it would be more feasible if you manage to involve the researcher or author or creator or how you want to call it, him or her, um, in the process. So the next section focuses on this role of the author um, and it discusses the, um, how should I say, the tension between editorial control and authorship in the showcases that we produced connected to the research data journal, um, a lot of work was taken over by the editors, in particular by Leen Bruren. Um, and the role of the author was limited. Uh, and that makes them perhaps too costly. And, uh, but it would be much cheaper if we could provide um, a kind of a standard wizard um, by which a showcase can be created almost uh, automatically. And you see an, a, a screen um, capture of what such a wizard um, and even, uh, let's say, a, a prototype or a, work, yeah, a working prototype of that exists, um, of how that could work. Uh, but you have limited functionality if you, if you standardize it, especially if you uh, look at what I said on the point 4.1, that there is many alternative forms possible. And of course, that is difficult to grab in a standard wizard. The durability is an issue as, as well. Um, but you might wonder whether that is really problematic if showcases have uh, uh, survive only a limited time. Um, perhaps also the interest in data sets is, um, is limited to uh, reduce time. And perhaps it's not that awful if they... Um, die after some time. And the fifth subject um, is about the challenge of innovation, uh, which we personally also experienced, I would say, that um, it's not a really easy task to, um, to do these things. Um, perhaps the, the, the third uh, point that is mentioned here, the innovator's dilemma is the most important. 
because uh, cultural change is much slower than technical change. So the take up, it ultimately depends on the, on the researchers and the authors or the depositors, whether they would like that this kind of approach. And what we witnessed was that the take up is only very slowly, although they usually very much like the idea and also the result of the showcases. Peter, just um, just to say, I noticed you have quite a few slides left, um, but we have a very limited time. So if you could move towards the end, if possible. Yes, I think it will be it will be uh, really uh, quickly. I've I think I have three more slides, but I wasn't planning anyhow to say much on the conceptual model for data publishing that is in the article. I just wanted to draw your attention to that. Uh, also, the, the the schema that you see here is is simply too complicated to to say in a few words, but I would like you to read the article, which which uh, gives more on that. I would like to end that I'm well aware that by focusing on this subject, on the relationship between data archives, data publications or data journals, and data showcases, I'm only covering a limited portion of what you could call the whole publication package of a study. And it was an afterthought anyhow, it is not in the article. And that is why I can also go very briefly uh, over this. But the idea is that there is different material types coming out of research projects, ranging from the project proposal, usually not published at all, to teaching materials, articles, book publications, well, you name it, software, the data set itself, documentation, all these material types exist and they have limited, no, sorry, they have different availabilities and there is different roles by different institutions who take care of making them available or not available. I've tried to visualize that in this diagram where data archives tend to focus on processed source data, on data documentation, and perhaps also on digital supplements. And also it, to some degrees on data management plans, although that is usually not their re responsibility. The data management plan is often a requirement from a funder and connected to a project proposal and is not accessible at all. But ultimately I would say what we aim at is to have this whole package of publication, um, let us say materials in all its variety have that available in an interconnected way. And although data archives are put here in the center, as there is many people from data archives here, it's obviously not something that data archives can achieve on their own. Uh, publishers um, and funders um, and institutions and the researchers themselves obviously would also have a role, but this is the kind of uh, um, broader outlook that I think that we um, would need um, to go to in the longer run. And that is actually what I wanted to say. So I hope I didn't take too much time. No, it's perfect timing. Um, thanks for your interesting uh, presentation. The last few slides were very intriguing. Um, I wonder if we have any questions. I didn't see any particular questions in the chat, but maybe we have a minute or two for one or two questions live now, if there's anyone who wants to ask a question or make a comment, maybe you can raise your hand if so. Um, there, there was your earlier question, Peter, which linked more to Therfim's, um part. Um, which maybe we could quickly come back to, but that I'm a little bit concerned that that it's such an important question that it would take a lot of time and then we would lose some time for the next presentation from Ruth Fisher. Um, maybe I can just ask you one thing because I still don't see any hands up, but with respect to your um, previous slide, um, which is a very nice, intriguing um, visual, how much time do you, how far are we from, are we from this kind of system where you have such interlinked 
um, materials in a, in a publication package? Is it is it a long term vision? Is it something that is re feasible in the near term? How do you see that? Well, if you go back to the slides that I presented before that, and I I, I put it on my screen now. Uh, there, I try to indicate with colors how far away we are uh, 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 from the, let us say, ideal situation. Mm -hmm. and, and my guess would be that, uh, let us say, articles and books are the best available publication type. So they are dark green. And then mm -hmm. come the light green, um, um, which is uh, processed source data, data documentation and digital supplements. Um, and they are light green because there is still many data sets that are not archived in data repositories or data archives. And then come the yellow ones. Um, and ultimately the, the well, there's the, the, the two red ones and the, the purple one I ones is still, I, I think, a, a kind of a blind spot, uh, but actually is a very uh, important uh, medium data papers and those data showcases would be the ideal medium to glue everything together. Um, so yeah, it is all in the process, but look, uh, I've had a history of about, um, um, what is it, 30, 40 years in data archiving. Um, and um, I've seen a lot uh, changed, change. Um, a lot has been reached, uh, but how far off it is, I don't know. It could be five years, it could be, could be 15, it could be 25, um, but, but, but somewhere in that range, it depends. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for, for that. Um, there is something from Bani uh, Wolf Bernish. Yeah. Bani. Hi. Yeah. Hi. Nice to meet you. Um, yes, actually, I had also a question on the um, publication package. Um, um, yeah, it's interesting to see the, the whole collection together and what has to be done. My question is what you think. Is it um, how to start first? Should it be each data archive or each country should, should think about, or do you think there would be need a more um, European approach? Mm. Uh, it, you, you know, uh, th those things, I think they never, um, there is never a just one uh, approach. The different things could happen simultaneously and are happening in a way simultaneously. Like um, the whole open access movement started also with perhaps with, with uh, journal articles and then books, and then re, uh, it, it shifted towards data. Um, and there also, it, it was not just the, the, the policies by funders, for instance, that, that changed everything, because they, the, 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 the funder policies are also driven by the demands of, of the researcher. So it is a, a two-way or even multi-way process. Um, but I do think that data archives can, 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 first of all, by raising the awareness and by raising the issue, as I'm also doing here, by the way, um, helps. And, uh, then I'm sure that, um, that also in the pol the policy makers have, have also seen that in the open science movement, that, um, the the approach would be more broad and whether really everything can be open probably never you know um, uh, i don't believe in heaven on earth there will always be limitations and practical difficulties and you name it but we can uh, still improve things and and um, probably i find it a strange thing thing for instance that data management plans are not usually not open there is a couple uh, but also many not, and I don't understand exactly why. Um, so it it might help to focus on sp specific categories. Software is another category that is very promising. And actually, as we right as we speak, uh, there is another conference going on on um, uh, open software um, and software management plans. Uh, so yeah. I have no easy answer here. It is a multi-way approach, but data archives could focus, for instance, on data management plans, perhaps also on software, and I think also data journals and data showcases. Thank you, Peter. Um, I think we need to move on so that we don't have to sacrifice our, our break. Uh, 
um, in a little while. So um, I will stop sharing. Thank you. Okay, so let me um, introduce our next presenter, um, Ruth Fisher, um, uh, from uh, Open Science Europe. But maybe I, I will ask Ruth to present herself and say a few words about who she is and what she does, and then to open her presentation and get started. Hello, thank you so much for inviting me to take part in this conference today. Um, it's a real pleasure to come and listen. I'm sorry that I was a little bit late starting. It's been a bit of a busy day. Um, so I actually work for Open Research Europe rather than Open Science Europe. Um, Open Research Europe is the European Commission's um, open access publishing platform um, specifically for Horizon funded researchers, um, although this has recently been extended to also include um, people who are members of cost actions, people who are Euronet projects and also um, uh, people who are part of your Eurotome. So there's a real variety of people that can publish with us. Um, my plan today is to give you a short introduction to what Open Research Europe is, how it functions, and then also to talk about um, the humanities and social science data guidelines that have been created by my colleagues who are actually on this call, I think, as well today. So there's Dr. Rebecca Grant, and uh, who works for F1000. She's the head of data and software publishing. Um, and there's also, I think, Matt Cannon here as well, who um, works in a similar sort of role for um, Taylor and Francis. So I'll just share my screen now um, and hopefully you can see my slides now. I'll just put them in presenter mode. Um, OK, great. Can everybody see my slides now? Um, I can see them, but it, it still doesn't seem to be in full in screen mode. mode. Mm, sorry. It looks like it's trying to load, but it was not. Let me managing. try again. Mm -hmm. Is that visible now? Can you see that? That's very good. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um. So, just move this on. There we go. So, um, I work for F One Thousand, uh, which is a publishing company in the UK. We have our own platforms. Uh, we have one called F1000 Research, which works on a similar sort of open science model. But we also build publishing platforms for uh, other people, such as funders. Um, so, for example, we work with the Wellcome Trust and the Gates Foundation, amongst others, to um, build them a platform where their researchers can publish uh, for free. Um, so we were quite a natural partner for the European Commission when they were looking for somebody to build a platform for them. Um, the platform is entirely owned by the European Commission, so we have built it for them, but we are really providing um, a publishing service for them at the moment. So um, the main, they have kind of control of the, the vision and the, um, the scope of the platform, and we are just implementing that for them and also um, advising them uh, on ways that they could develop the platform as well. So uh, kind of a quick overview of why Open Research Europe is very different. I hope this will be of interest to you, particularly following on from the last um, talk, which was very interesting. Um, this is a diamond open access publishing platform. So it means that anybody that has Horizon Europe, Horizon 2020 funding, or as I mentioned, people who are part of a cost action um, or a member of an internet project can also come and publish here for free. Obviously, it's not completely for free. Um, there are costs associated with publishing open access, but we charge the European Commission 780 euro. And this is something that happens directly between us and the European Commission. So as an author, when you submit, you just put in your grant number. This allows you to pass, pass through and submit to the platform. And um, there are no author facing fees. So this is something that is really, um, I think it's great about the platform. It gives people the chance to publish open access without having to kind of fork out thousands of dollars for um, a publication. The platform itself works on a sound science basis. So the idea here is that 
rather than you know on traditional journals you have editor-in-chief and associate editors and their job is to assess how novel is this research um how big a contribution does it make to the network uh, or to the research community um how many famous authors do we have on this article things like that um the aim of our platform and this is something that the european commission really wanted and we're really keen on is that um number one the peer review process is what what decides the quality of the research rather than um you know an, an article being submitted and a and a handling editor making a decision to reject before it's even gone for peer review if you are eligible to publish here and the the work is of a su sufficient standard we will send it out for peer review um and the whether or not it's it's appropriate will be um assessed through the peer review process that is that's kind of king in this model um and what we're asking is not that this is some kind of it doesn't need to be hugely novel it doesn't need to be really exciting what we want and what we're looking for is that the research has been properly conducted so the study design is appropriate so the um the work has been properly contextualized and situated within the research area lots of things like that so there's a basic threshold that an article needs to meet and if you have conducted your research properly if you have written it up properly then it should eventually pass peer review on this platform the last thing to mention is that we use a transparent post-publication peer review process this means that your research is published online and then it is sent for peer review afterwards and the research and, and the review process is entirely transparent so the author and the reviewer both know uh, who each other are but as a reader you will know this information as well because we publish peer review reports alongside the article um, with the peer reviewer name so it is completely transparent so how does this work in practice um, when you submit your article um, what initially happens is that you have a team of professional editors like me who make an assessment of the article um, so their job is to check whether this is ready to go out for peer review yet. So they will be checking lots of things, actually. It's a really in-depth process compared to the, the level of checking that I've seen happen on um, kind of more traditional journals by, by academic editors. So they will spend around two hours looking at each article. And in that time, they'll be assessing, is this article structured correctly? Um, is it referenced properly? Are the figures and tables appropriate? Um, uh, are there any potential ethical issues? Uh, are there any issues with plagiarism? And they will also be assessing the quality of the English. So um, they won't be correcting it, but the idea is that they it should be a sufficient standard that any peer reviewer can read it and understand it. So they'll provide the author with some suggestions about how they can improve their article. The author has the chance to make these updates. They resubmit to us. And if everything's OK, we will publish it online. At this point, um, it's expected that the data, any data that's been created in the course of the research is shared in a repository um, and that we link to it with the publication um, so that when you look online, the, the article has a DOI and it's visible and citable from our website. But there's also a direct link to the research that's there. Uh, sorry, the underlying data that backs up the article. This is because, um, well, it's, it's a fundamental principle of open science that you make your data available, but also we ask peer reviewers to assess it during the peer review process. So we link this information together. Um, the peer review process um, is really led by the author. So this means that we ask authors to suggest reviewers. Um, obviously, we have a team of peer review experts who manage this process. Um, and their job will be to check for any potential conflict of interest um, when the reviewers are submitted. So you can't submit somebody who is too closely related to you. So, you know, a PhD student or someone from your department or someone that you collaborate with closely. The aim is that this person has to be an independent reviewer. Um, the peer review process um, is based upon the sound science principles that I mentioned before. So as a reviewer, you're able to give a full review as you normally would with any other um, any other journal. But we also ask five sound science questions to check 
that the publication meets the essential threshold that it should meet to pass peer review. So things like, um, has the data been made available alongside the article um, or has sufficient data been made available alongside the article to understand the article? Um, is the study design appropriate? Is it properly situated within the, the research area? Things like that. So essentially this basic threshold has to be met. Um, the research, the, the reviewers can't reject an article because it's already been published online. Um, so what they will instead do is offer a status so they can they can either say that it's been approved article, it's approved with reservation, which is like minor corrections, or it's not approved, which would be like major revisions. Um, we always uh, get a minimum of two peer reviewers to review the article, although it's often more. Um, and we would, um, when we've got these two peer review reports in, we would send this back to the author. Um, they have the chance to revise their article and resubmit it to us. We would also ask them to respond publicly to the peer review comments to kind of continue this open dialogue about the peer review process. Um, and when they resubmit, we would publish a new version of the article online. So, as a reader, you're always directed to this newer version uh, or the newest version of the article, but the older versions don't disappear. So you can click back through uh, and look at how the article has developed in line with the peer review comments going alongside it. So I think this turns uh, the peer review process into something that is really collaborative and iterative. Um, as an author, there's no barriers to you being in contact with your reviewer and talking to them about, um, you know, clarifying something you don't understand in the peer review report or develop, you know, working with them to understand things better. As a peer reviewer, I think you are both held to account for what you say in your review, but also given the credit for, um, for all the work that you put into your review. People who read it can see, wow, this person really knows their stuff. Um, and I can see how, you know, we could collaborate in a different way. And the great thing is that actually anybody who reads this article can benefit from the peer review process. So closed peer review works fine, um, but this just works a lot better. You know, everybody in the research community has the opportunity to learn from the peer review process um, and also to make their own judgment on what the peer reviewer said, how the author has responded to it. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm slightly losing my voice. So how does this cycle of peer review and revision end? Uh, essentially, we class something as having passed peer review. Once two reviewers have approved it or one has approved it and two has approved with reservation. So essentially minor corrections. And at that point, we will then distribute it out to indexes and repositories. And this is when it's more available online. Um, I think one other thing to mention about the platform is that we do not and will not have an impact factor. This is kind of an ideological standpoint from the European Commission, but actually we agree with it as well in principle. The idea that research um, assessment shouldn't be based solely upon journal level metrics. Um, the European Commission has an ongoing project at the moment called Reforming Research Assessment, which is designed to take a more holistic approach to uh, researcher assessment. So rather than focusing heavily on where have you managed to publish the results of your research, this is looking more broadly at all the contributions that researchers make. Um, this could be teaching, it could be reviewing, it could be um, acting in a, in a committee role on a, a cost action or something like that. It's really trying to look in a different way at how people assess research. So these are kind of the really fundamentally different things about Open Research Europe. Um, it's a really different model, but I think it's a really positive one. And it has quite a long term vision um, from the European Commission. So, for example, at the moment, they are speaking to around 15 different national funders um, with the plan that they will bring them on board so that anybody with national funding can also publish in this diamond open access way. So, um, yeah, I think it's really interesting, but I think probably it's time to move on to um, our HSS specific data guidelines, as that's <laughs> really what you're uh, um, kind of interested in.
So these have been developed by Dr. Rebecca Grant, who's the head of data and software publishing at F1000. She's on the call today, so I'm hoping she'll be able to support me with some um, answers to questions if you have any. And that was in co collaboration with lots of other colleagues um, across Taylor and Francis and F1000. Um, so the aim of these guidelines is really to explain open data specifically with a focus on humanities and social science data. So I think something that uh, Rebecca and, and these other people on the team noticed is that if you look at other publishers, um, often their data guidelines are not specific for people working in humanities and social sciences. So they wanted to develop something that would give um, give researchers in those areas a broader understanding of what research data could mean to them and how they could um, present that. So this was initially implemented on Routledge Open Research, which is um, a new platform that's been developed specifically for humanities and social science uh, articles. Um, but it's actually recently been approved for, by the European Commission for Use on Open Research Europe. So, um, I put a link to the guidelines and um, this will show the guidelines for Routledge Open Research because we only got approval for this last week so we've not actually kind of put that page up on the Open Research Europe website but there will be some kind of ab adaptations essentially for um, on Open Research Europe so what you see there so for example um, the these the guidelines on Open Research Europe will link to a bigger range of repositories across Europe um, and I think there's a lot of existing infrastructure that um, we kind of want to link to. For, so, for example, we're going to link out to um, SESTA and to DARIA. So there's going to be um, kind of more region specific um, uh, guidelines in place on European, on Open Research Europe. Um, so what do these guidelines aim to do? So I think one of the things we mentioned that was that the standard data policy was mostly based uh, that we had whether we was it on F1000 originally was mostly based on life sciences and a lot of the terminology was around that area. So one of the things that they were working on was to make sure that um, they were able to talk about this um, research data and, and the kind of things that people use from a humanities and social sciences perspective. Um, I think it was also looking at the kind of data sources that people use across humanities and social sciences. So um, I think people often typically think of data as something that you find in a spreadsheet. Um, and there's actually a lot of ways that humanity and social science researchers use data um, that means that they, they might not be using their own data set. They, oh, sorry, I think I can hear something on the call. Um, yeah, so they might not be using um, their own data set, they might be using sources from museums or galleries or libraries. Um, so it's not always appropriate for them to share their data. This is an expectation usually on our articles, but it's not always appropriate. So one of the things that they wanted to do was to explain how to give access to this information for other people. So more than just citing it in your references, it's given an explanation of this is, these are the data sources that I've used and this is how you can access them. Um, and I think the other thing to mention is that the, the data guidelines give some examples of data availability statements so that people can um, begin to understand how they could present this information themselves. And it also links to a lot of best practice. So um, their aim was not to um, kind of create something entirely new. They know that there are a lot of um, existing structures and existing research that has been done out there. So it was really to bring this together with a humanities and social science focus rather than trying to reinvent the wheel. Um, so this slide, I'm realizing that I've nearly run out of time, so I'm gonna try and wrap this up. But this slide is just to kind of show some of the, um, these are actually real data availability statements that can be found on Routledge Open Research. And it's showing the way that we kind of encourage people to talk about the data sources that they're using. The aim here really is to be as transparent as possible and to help people show off the, 
the diversity of materials and sources that they're using. Um, and also to make sure that it's really easy for people who are reading their research to be able, if they want to know more about this data source, to be able to follow it and to um, find out more about it. Um, so I'm going to just stop at this point because I think um, there really isn't very much time left. Um, and I know that some people might have questions. So um, yeah, I will pause there. I think if people would like to know more, hopefully I might be able to answer the questions, but hopefully if not, then um, Rebecca and Matt might be able to jump in and, and support on this as well. So I'll just stop sharing my slides now. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, what I would propose, um, if it's okay with everyone, is that we take one or two questions and then we take a break from 310 to 315 Central Eastern time. Um, so it means we have a few minutes, uh, maybe two minutes for a question or two or a comment. Anybody? We can always also take a break for seven minutes instead of five. Uh, if I may, Mariana is speaking uh, If I may ask Ruth, uh, so you, you have shown us uh, this data availability statement with references to data sets which were used in uh, articles. Uh, do you have also a policy and recommendation to cite data sets uh, in a list of references at the end of the article? Um, yes, I think so. I think that would be an expectation as well. I don't know if Rebecca or Matt, well, Matt wants to jump in on that. I don't think the idea is to replace what people are doing in their references, um, because obviously you need to do that as a, as a normal standard practice. But I think the idea is really that it makes visible things that people might not previously have considered as data, but this is a data set that other people can access and use. Um, does that answer your question? Yes. Uh, okay, so Rebecca's put something in the chat as well. So she says we do. <laughs> yeah, mandatory for authors who include a data citation and add the data to their reference list. Yes, great. Yeah. Because th this is something that we, uh, from from data archives, uh, that we see that it's not uh, always happening, uh, and it's important. We, we want to follow data usage and uh, things like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just jump in and add. Um, so we're also Scholar compliant. So we're starting to mark up our data citations a bit better to get them into that network, so you can follow them, which I think historically has not necessarily been done, but we're improving. Right. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks to Ruth. Um, uh, so let's let's now take a five minute break and come back at a quarter after the hour. Thank See you. you short. See you shortly. See you. It's time. So it's time to slowly come back. Hopefully you can hear me. Okay. Uh, so now we are moving from European landscape to a more global perspective. Uh, there are several interesting examples which are all contributing to the process of making science more transparent, reproducible and trustworthy, each one from completely different perspective. For this session, we invited three interesting people to present three very interesting operational examples of practicing open science. Uh, this will give us an opportunity to learn about diversity of approaches to open science, and hopefully this can also inspire us to contribute more to this emerging culture. Uh, whether this contribution is by being involved with one of the existing initiatives or maybe by creating new communities of practice and also services and tools to support such communities. 
One route to data sharing is through building infrastructure. Many digital assets like knowledge databases and repositories have been created to support sharing information. Standards were created to make to these tools better. Another route can be through creating policies on data preservation, management and sharing, which is done by international funding agencies, regulators, journals, and other organizations. As well as databases, many such policies already exist. It's just sometimes hard to find them. That's why for this session, we invited Alison Lister, Senior Knowledge Engineer, currently serving as Fair Sharing Content and Community Lead. And she will explain how research standards, databases and policies come together in one ecosystem to enable fair data. Uh, Alison, I invite you to share your screen and start your presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. I will start with the traditional, can you see my screen? Yes. Perfect. Perfect. I shall continue then. Great. <laughs> Thank you for inviting me. I'm really excited to be talking uh, within this SESTA forum because fair sharing is applicable across all research domains, but we are particularly engaging at the moment with social sciences and humanities. So I invite you to start thinking for the next few minutes about communities and relationships, because that's what's at the core of fair sharing and what I'll be talking a lot about today. Um, I'm also going to be talking to you about the RDA EOS Future Domain Ambassadorship, of which I'm a part. I'm one of five who have been become ambassadors for the next year. And we're out here to sort of promote and engage within the RDA and EOSC as well as within the broader communities. Now, fair sharing. I have talked a lot about relationships and I've been talking about community and you're going to hear a bit more about that. And another word I like to use is ecosystem. So fair sharing is truly a descriptive ecosystem of research data standards and databases. And we're here to help you find fair enabling resources, enable fair data in your own communities and discover connections. So how do we do this? Well, we provide these curated descriptions of policies, databases, and standards, but primarily beyond these descriptions, we really talk about the relationships that they have to each other. So these are the standards implemented by a repository or the databases and standards recommended by a journal publisher or journal policy. So how do we do this and what is the way that we can help you? Well, we have over 3,800 records. The number grows almost daily and we have over a thousand contributors. Now these aren't our users. Those, that's over a hundred thousand of views from since the beginning. This, these are our real people who create accounts with us, who maintain records with us to promote their resources and who are also community curators. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that later in our presentation. But you can think about two main ways in which people interact with fair sharing. Firstly, they come to us as a consumer of fair sharing. So these are the people looking to discover resources and to find the right ones to use for their data. Then we also have producers, and these are the people who develop the standards, the databases, and the policies who come to fair sharing to make their resources more visible, more widely adopted, and more cited. So we have a broad range of stakeholders that fit across sometimes both consumer and producer roles, and sometimes just one or the other. We've worked really closely with groups, uh, broad research data groups, such as the RDA, Force 11 and GoFair. We're also a recommended resource in a number of EOS reports, and we're a recommended interoperability resource within Elixir. Although to be fair, Elixir is life science, and we can focus more on, on EOSC as a whole. And we also work really closely with uh, journals, publishers, and funders. So I mentioned relationships, and this is because you really need to have a strong user community in order to provide the relevant information across an entire research community. And this isn't just a research community built of one research area. This screenshot is of our subject browser. And so it really showcases how we accept 
databases, standards, and policies from all different disciplines within humanities and social science, which I'll be talking about today, but also engineering and natural sciences. So uh, to, in order to, to, to really be successful as a project, our relationships are at the core of our, of our curation approaches. And these are the relationships among the records, as I've said, but also the relationships between fair sharing and the community that we serve. So I'm gonna bang on a little bit about this. You're gonna go away wondering why you're hearing so much about the word community and relationships, but really it's the most exciting thing for me. So first of all, the relationships among the records. You can get a graph like this for every single one of those 3,800 records in our databases. And this graph shows the different ways in which one resource interacts with all of its related resources, whether it's policies, databases, or standards. And we can look at this in the context of F1000 as a particular use case, because first of all, you guys were just speaking a few minutes ago. And secondly, because just this week, we've gained a new community curator, well, in the last week or two of Kay Burroughs from F1000, and she's going to have a look at the data policies within F1000 and within fair sharing, just as described within fair sharing. So journals and jour journal publishers um, really work with us to maintain and create their data policies to help their um, authors format and store their data according to the guidelines produced by the journals and journal publishers. And so here's a screenshot of the record for, for F1000, which will be updated in the coming weeks, but which has also got some really great content in it already. They maintain fair sharing data policy records with us. They add metadata, they list the recommended databases and data standards. And in return, fair sharing provides a standardized machine and human accessible policy descriptions and relationships. And I know we don't often talk about FAIR in the context of the policies themselves. Uh, we really talk about it mostly in the context of data. But just remember that one of the, one of the pillars of the F in FAIR is machine ac actionable metadata. And we have that across all of the records in our registry. For us, our data is the information about your resources. So if we have another look at the current state of the graph for the F1000 research data policy, you can really see not just the direct connections, the, those recommendations from the data policy out to the different databases and standards, but also the relationships among those resources and how connected those resources are. And you can do a lot of work within this graph. It's not just a static image. You can click through and traverse the graph. To, and this helps with resource discovery. A lot of our community accesses the graphs for gap analysis and targeted outreach and engagement. And it's not just the relationships among the records that we store. It's also the relationships with our tool development com community. So these are people who are listed on our sister site, fairassist.org, who are involved in fair assessment and fair evaluation, such as Mark Wilkinson's uh, fair evaluation services. We also have other tool users who are data management plan uh, uh, tools, such as Data Stewardship Wizard, and also our recent collaboration with OpenAir that uh, has allowed us to export our metadata for databases right through to the OpenAir Knowledge Graph. And this allows us to prov provide our machine actionable metadata to any any tool that might need us. This is those uh, DMP tools. This is the, the fair evaluation and fair test, fairness test, um, test tools. And there's lots of different ways that you can use us from the, the perspective of tool developers. But we also have a really strong relationship with the people, as I said before, who develop standards and develop the guidance on, you might say, minimal metadata about repositories, about standards, about policies. And we've done a lot of exciting work recently, both within our policy records and within our database records to provide new fields that our maintainers and our users can look at and enrich that will help describe the sort of the minimal information required to describe a repository. This helps people choose repositories, yes? So I remember earlier in the talk today, we were 
there was the uh, concern, the things that were most important to you guys as a result of that survey was things like versioning, persistent identifiers. Does your database allow embargoing of, of data? Are there, um, is, is the resource curated? What's the sustainability plan? Related software, peer review, all of these things are fields within database records and fair sharing. That means that you can search and you can filter based on all of these things. So things that are important to you, you can find out through fair sharing, okay? We also, oh, also, I should also point out that as part of the RDA, we've produced a lot of this information um, and we've informed the data model and fair sharing is directly created based on community feedback. So things like the outputs of RDA, things like the fair fair data policy checklist, and I'm a co-chair on the Data Repository Attribute Working Group together with the lovely Matt Cannon, who is here today. And so if you have any question about any of that, then absolutely ask us. And also relationships with the guidance documents and the guidance sites like the FAIR Cookbook and RDM Kit, which I really strongly encourage you guys to take a look at because these provide recipes and guidance for how to be fair. So as I said before, we work with these communities and they allow us to um, help us decide what metadata to put in our fair sharing records. And this is just one example of the various data processes that I just mentioned before that were a result of your survey and that which are available on our fair sharing records. This in particular is just the dryad record. Then we have the relationships with our communities. This is exemplified with our community curators, but also through our maintainers. The maintainers come to us and edit one record. So that means they have one or maybe a few records for which they're directly responsible. They're developers of that resource. Community curators are domain experts who have come to us looking to engage and learn about the ecosystem and the relationships within their particular domain, whether it's social sciences. We have a number of new social science community curators, biodiversity, astronomy, physics, in environmental or engineering science, and also people who are more targeted according to a particular registry, like they want to look at policies. Our community also develops collections. That's groups of databases and standards that are relevant to them, such as this IVOA uh, collection, which lists all of those resources that are developed by IVOA itself. So let's look a little bit more into the community curation program, because although we already have some social science and humanities community curators, we are always looking for more who are ready to engage and, and, and work with us. So first of all, you have organizations who are looking to promote their work, and you have researchers within those organizations who are looking to fair sharing for information. And through fair sharing, we can help those researchers, researchers by helping them become maintainers or community curators, showcase their projects, reveal hidden connections, do that gap analysis, and enrich fair sharing content in return, as well as themselves gaining attribution and expertise. And the organizations get something out of it too, because engagement with fair sharing, as I said before, aids with resource discovery, gap analysis, and targeted outreach and engagement. And we really help you create customized views, we can help you promote your organization, and, and in return, you get a lot from us. An example is one of our early adopters. So Kyle Kopas from GBIF, which is a biodiversity project, wanted to perform a landscape analysis. And so he joined as a biodiversity community curator. And we attributed him through his ORCID. He has a volunteer service that shows that he's been working with us. And also he's been able to enrich the connections within his research area. And as a result, pull those connections programmatically back and create a tailored view of fair sharing for them. And as I say, these tailored views, these collections are really, really important because they provide ways for you as a community to showcase those resources that you develop or perhaps that you recommend, those that are mapped to each other or developed within a particular standards development organization. And we provide lots of ways for your organizations and your individual users to gain attribution for the work that you do at Fair Sharing. On the right is an example of the GBIF organization page where you can see uh, 17 records. There's are 17 resources, whether they're standards or, or databases that are linked to GBIF. And on the right, you see our, our lovely community curator, Kyle, the records he directly maintains and his award for, uh, and his relationship with the organization. This is the work he did or the graph that he built. And this is the graph that they built through using our API on their own website that showcases and tailors the results just for them. 
Now, I thought I would highlight just one of our lovely community curators. Uh, this is Jean-Pierre Michaud, who is one of our um, humanities and social sciences uh, community curators who's done a lot of work in the early stages. They've only gotten started uh, last month properly, and they've already started working on and editing fair sharing records and getting an attribution uh, back for that. So in return for working with us, they can, they can gain attribution through their ORCID, through our website, and also ultimately they'll gain um, a showcase of the expertise that they've gained through tagging on those profiles with interesting skill sets and terms. Like uh, if, they, if they work with a number of uh, persistent identifier records, I know that was something that came up in some of the previous speakers today. If they edit the uh, significant number of persistent identifier or other type of identifier schema records within fair sharing, we can give them an expertise tag around persistent identifiers that shows the work that they've, the expertise they've gained while they've been working with us. Now I'm just shy of 15 minutes, so I will stop now, but thank you very much. And I hope, and I hope that you very much enjoyed this whirlwind tour of the community curation program and affair sharing itself. Thanks. Yeah, thank, thank you, Alison. We actually still have at least three minutes uh, for your for your session. So I would like to invite people from the audience to ask questions. You can simply turn on your microphone or you can write in chat whatever you want. So what I can say from my personal experience with uh, fairsharing.org uh, is that it's 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 really uh, exciting to see such a resource which is curated with uh, so much attention. I must say that uh, I was very present, uh, very, very pleasantly surprised when I saw all this back and forward feedback. And it was very quick because I didn't say I also work in data archives. So I was, of course, uh, uh, trying to register the archive there. And it, it was really pleasant experience. And uh, yeah, all this relevant information that you can enter there. So I would like to encourage uh, other data archives also to, to, to share uh, information about their services related to data sharing on this uh, platform. Thank you. Those are lovely words. Thank you very much. And I'm glad you had a great experience with us. I mean, it's yeah. certainly something to consider. What are the community, what is the way in which your community views resources? Do you have a set of guidelines for which repositories you recommend? Yes, SESTA as one of these other um, uh, groupings that you might have. It might be that you wish to showcase those resources through a fair sharing collection. So, you know, get in touch, find out what you want. You know, I can put you in touch as well with with any of our social science and humanities community curators, if you wish to talk to them first and engage with them uh, as well. Yeah. And if anyone so, here would like to, would like, is interested and in thinks they might like to take part, then just get in touch with us. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, so, yeah, it's very nice to see all this technical good goodies that we have and, uh, uh, that funders and journals uh, are creating uh, policies and recommendations and requir requirements about data sharing. But uh, if we don't, don't work on, uh, on changing behavior of scientists, we will actually not make social, make science, science more transparent. Uh, so some of the ways to facilitate such change, such behavioral change can be to recognize the importance and value of non-traditional or non-usual forms of reporting research results and enabling communication channels for such forms to be published. So this is done by data journals, and this can be considered as another route to open science. So on our next speaker, Ulbe Bosma, is a senior researcher at the International Institute of Social History, and he will speak about the research data journal for the humanities and social sciences in his role as a member of the editorial board for this journal. So, Ube, please, can you share your presentation? And the floor is yours. Thank you.
uh, you can can you please unmute yourself yes much yeah. better isn't it yes much better <laughs> good can you hear me as clear now yes we can hear you and we can see your presentation good thank you yes i will be talking from the viewpoint of a researcher i'm an economic social historian um used to well of course publish in 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 uh, high-ranking journals and high-ranking publishers etc cetera, etc cetera. not open to access is not our first concern because we have to survive in a, in a highly competitive environment but still, I think that as an economic and social historian working with a lot of data, and our institute is not only a, a research institute, but is also an archival institute and has also a lot of digital archives here. And so we have our data for us here. So I'm a little bit in between the two worlds, so to speak. But today we'll primarily speak as a, uh, as a researcher and um, to talk about how I think uh, I can encourage, we can encourage fellow researchers to uh, share their data and also to show them that sharing data can be done in such a way that it will contribute to their uh, career, that it will that they will get the credits for it, because that's a big uh, um, issue here. Let me see whether I can um, move my, um, my, my uh, what is it? Wow, does this work? Let me see, why is it blocked? Uh, yeah, this one, sorry, yes. So I'm. Uh, it was about eight or nine years ago that at our institute, the International Institute of Social History, I was talking to some people working with huge data uh, collections and said, well, um, there's a problem here that as researchers, we do gather data, but um, we publish articles and we get the credits for the articles, but we don't get the credits for all the data we are uh, collecting. And uh, we should consider data collection, writing the code books, be handling properly the, the metadata, sharing uh, data as a, as a solid uh, part of our academic work. So we need a kind of change in, in culture. And we thought that a research data journal would be a way to do that. So publish our data and, and give us a description of our data, not just the metadata, but also uh, 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 relate to the to the readers uh, what uses can, could be of this of these uh, those data. Uh, fortunately, uh, our director at that time was also in touch with Peter Dorn of Dance, um, and there was a contact with Brill Publishers, and the three uh, came together. And uh, I think five or six years ago, we started with the research data journal for the humanities and the social sciences. Um, and it covers a, a, a couple of, uh, of fields of the disciplines, uh, archaeology, uh, social economic history, uh, oral history, language and literature, and audiovisual media. And it's still, still very much work in progress. I think this is the beginning, and I hope in the coming decade, this journal will become much a, a flourishing journal with a lot of contributions. So it's uh, Diamond Open Access. And this is registered with uh, scope, so it's a proper academic journal, so to speak. So what I want to talk uh, in the coming 10 minutes, 10, 15 minutes, um, that's about the philosophy behind the research data journal, the type of data sets we're looking at, the length of the articles, because it's a debate among our uh, editorial board, the fair principles, how we see them, and um, the way in which we think that uh, the uh, research data journal and the trusted repositories can work uh, complementary and uh, can perhaps create more synergy than they do at this stage. Um, I already said, constructing a data set in accordance with FAIR principles should be uh, considered to be a genuine academic, an important academic achievement. So this is something not, the data is something where you, you gather for your own article or your book, and then you put them away and they will gather dust digital dust perhaps in these days and that's it so that's that's the attitude of many of my colleagues let's let, let's be fair about that um there are some colleagues however who are uh, keen to construct a public data sets so we, i'm myself i'm involved in a uh, uh, in a, a project to construct a, a database 
on maritime slave trading in Asia, for example. And that's something which seems to be completely divorced from our research activities. So these are th things are completely separate. And I think for researchers, we need to do more to bring these two worlds together. So on the one hand, we have the data sets made for public use. And on the other hand, we have our own research. And I think these two fields should merge. Um, and this is what we try to do with this research data uh, journal is to encourage uh, our colleagues to share data uh, and according uh, uh, and encourage a culture of treating data in accordance with fair principles. Now, what kind of data we are looking at? Uh, perhaps one very important showcase is uh, a, a, a article which we published, I think, last year. Um, it's about the population of European cities from 700 to 3000. And this is a kind of ongoing process, ongoing for over the past 40, 50 years. There was a, a European historian, uh, Bayroch, he's a Swiss historian, who started gathering data on European cities. And this, these data have been improved and improved and improved. And I think with open data uh, and fair principles, we are enabling colleagues to contribute to a, an ongoing process of improving data. So this is a tremendous academic interest in, in social science and humanities involved in creating this kind of, uh, of culture. We also have been talking within among ourselves about the length of the articles. Uh, Peter Dorn already said, it's not just about uh, presenting an article and, and, uh, and, and giving kind of abstract or kind of exhibition, uh, talking about the metadata. It's, it's also a way for, particularly for the younger historians, to present themselves to the, to the field, to, to show that they gathered important data, that they also uh, drew some important conclusions from these data, and that they can also indicate uh, avenues for further research, which for themselves uh, they might uh, plan to, um, to um, submit research proposals, for example. So there's a way to present themselves. So in our view, it's important for younger historians who, who are starting their research career to give a little bit more space. And we have other uh, data sets uh, that are related to articles that have been published a couple of years ago and are, uh, are constructed by uh, already uh, quite senior researchers. And we think that for this category, perhaps uh, rather shorter statements, rather shorter uh, and brief announcements would, uh, would do. This is something which we're still discussing. It's an open end. We have not yet uh, decided on this, uh, on this uh, uh, um, subject. Now, the FAIR principles, I think this is with respect to the research data journal. Um, I think it's all covered. Uh, they're, it's findable, they're dual use, dual eyes. Uh, it's accessible. Uh, the article is done with open access. We demand that a database that is discussed in the article is in a repository, so it's open access already. Um, and that it's interoperable, so preferably it's somewhere in, in Dataverse or in, in some files which is, are indeed all interoperable. And of course, reusable, and that's, that means clarity about data structure, provenance, etc. Well, data structure, I think that is something which also the repositories will take care of. Uh, we don't want to have uh, uh, data sets which have all kinds of information showed in just one column. And I can assure you that this happens in, in my field. Uh, so these are the data sets need to be clean and tidy. Um, well, how, and that's also another question we are um, considering. How can the research data journal and its sisters uh, journal um, benefit more from the work from the repositories and, and the other way around? Well, substantively, I think that um, the repository sets technical criteria respect to data structure and, and metadata. But I think the editorial board of the research journal has its own view on uh, how to assess uh, articles or how to assess data sets. We look at the, the provenance, uh, but also at the, the relevance. You can, can gather trillions of, of data, but most data are not relevant for anyone. So what's the relevance? And that's of course, that, that requires domain specific uh, knowledge. And that's what we call the academic uh, quality. And I think these two things are wonderfully uh, complementary. 
Um, at this stage, the journal has a limited number of contributions. I counted it was just six in 2022. Um, but in, in this situation with the, the way we are facilitated, we can expand a bit, but in the future we might have not enough funds to, to, to grow anymore. But at this stage, we are, are fine. Um, of course, we want to expand. This is a lot of, of room, I think, for expansion for this uh, journal. Uh, one way to expand is by uh, exp extending the editorial board. It's not that, that large, I think six or seven members. Um, it could easily be expanded. And I think that with that, we will expand our networks and we will be able to, uh, to gather, acquire more uh, content. But it's also a matter of, and that's a question I would like to pose on behalf of my fellow editors. Uh, couldn't we do more uh, with respect to uh, the, the uh, repositories which receive the, uh, the data sets uh, to bring these to the attention of uh, a journal like Research Data Journal? And that uh, could help perhaps us to approach uh, authors to say, well, perhaps you should publish an article on this in our uh, journal to give it more exposure and to do, to do an exhibit. So that's a question I would like to, to pose in this respect, in the respect of my talk. Um, so it's quite a brief uh, talk. We are a modest uh, uh, project, but I think we are quite important this, this type of projects to link uh, scholars and particularly the younger generations of scholars to, uh, to open access and to fair uh, principles and to, uh, to data sharing. And also to impress upon them, that's important that uh, as, as Peter Dorn says, when you have a data management program and that's just done for, for well, for the ESC application or for, for National Science Foundation application, that is more than just to placate the funders. It's, it should be part of your thinking about research, that you have a data management uh, plan, that you have a, a proper codebook for uh, when you gather data, when you start data, first have a proper codebook, think about the metadata, and then from start from there. And all these uh, elements could be then part of a, the publication or the open access of your, um, of your data. Um, okay, this, I leave it here. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for presenting this uh, this journal, which is yeah a bit different than usual uh, research practice. So I would ask participants if they have any uh, questions or comments or maybe experiences with publishing data arch articles to share such experiences. So we still have time, some time for a few questions. While we are waiting, maybe I can ask uh, Ulbe to maybe explain more uh, what's, what, what are the main differences between, uh, let's say, traditional uh, research article published in common scientific journals and the data article. Uh, so we what are the main differences uh, or what are the main characteristics of data articles? Yeah, there, well, a, a typical research article is about the starts with the status question and, and then you, you have a research question and you elaborate on your research question and you present your, your, your findings, uh, usually with quite abbreviated uh, form. Uh, in a data journal, you start to describe the data sets as such, how it has been uh, constructed, how, it, how the data have been collected, and it could end with how the data sets, uh, well, benefited your own research, and then the final conclusion is how it could benefit uh, other researchers. So it's a completely different uh, uh, approach. You start with the data instead of starting with the, the, the research field or the academic questions that are uh, well appropriate considered to be appropriate to be to be answered so i think it's the the, the it's completely the other way around yeah thank thank you and, and so add, mm -hmm. it's it's important to 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 realize that for 
for many of us, we are trained in a way to think in terms of, well, how, how to contribute to an academic debate. And that's counted as academic work. And to present data is say, well, is it academic work? It's, it's completely contradicting, in fact, what we have been trained for for many years. So this is, uh, for that reason, it's so important to, to change the culture among uh, scholars. Yeah, because for for now we are not sure if this will be accepted for any needs uh, for scientists like uh, to 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 go further in career, etc. And this is we must admit a very important incentive for researchers. So they want these articles to be counted. Uh, yeah. So yeah, we want to. To give a little bit more space to the younger researchers who have perhaps are more vulnerable in that respect and we I think with more uh, senior researchers we can be more strict and say okay you have to stay within your uh, word limits um so this that's kind of the uh, yeah kind of calibration we have to apply mm. to this uh, mm. So, and how many submissions do you have for the journals? How, how much interested interest is is already shown for the for, for... now ten to fifteen? I must say that that's um, there's a kind of self selection. People know mm -hmm. when they apply for this journal that they should have uh, research data. So uh, we have very few uh, uh, submissions that are really out of of our um, our purview, um, mm. but it could be many more. I think. Yeah. Many more. I think it should be many more. Yeah, and maybe uh, some data on citations of these data articles. Do you have any insights into that? How many times this article, these data ar articles published in this journal, are cited in other articles? No. Do you have any? Uh... No, I don't. I, I, there must be these data must be available, but I personally don't have them. No, I'm sorry. No. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. And if there are no more questions from audience, uh, we can then continue. And uh, so as a slight introduction, I will come back to policies. And as I said, they are important to guide by behavior. Uh, but they cannot do much if they are left to their own devices because the requirements for data sharing are sometimes very superficially followed, we can see in practice. Uh, it is often enough if a researcher just share her data somewhere and somehow. Is this kind of data understandable or and reusable, we can ask? And what about the code that was created and or used to calculate results in a published article? There should be someone who takes care about the data and code quality. And this uh, someone uh, is taking yet another route to achieve open science. So our next speaker is Limor Peer. She comes from the Institution for Social and Policy Studies at Yale University, where she currently serves as the Associate Director for Research and Strategic Initiatives. Among many other interesting projects in her career, she co-founded the CURE, which stands for Curation and Reproducibility Consortium of Social Science Data Archives at Yale, Cornell, and the University of North Carolina. Uh, they are promoting practices that facilitate the digital preservation of the evidence base necessary for future understanding, evaluation, and the reproducibility of scientific claims. In her talk, she will explain what the cure is and why it is important. So welcome, Limor. Thank you for sharing your screen. And the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you really to the organizers for the opportunity to talk uh, with this group. I apologize that I came in a little bit late, late but I was able to follow the recent uh, talks, the two talks, and they're excellent, so I'm, I'm really thrilled to, to be here. 
So um, yes, I'm going to be talking about what curating for reproducibility is, and I'm going to talk about the Cure Consortium and what we are trying to do and how that relates to uh, journals and publications and um, the publication workflow. Um, our focus, I should say right out front, is uh, on social sciences. We start with data-driven um, social sciences, empirical studies using quantitative methods, but we are firm believers that the principles that we that, that I will be describing are applicable um, to other types of social sciences, as well as sciences and humanities and really any sort of data. So um, I'll spend a little bit of time talking um, about reproducibility, um, and the talk today really is uh, through the lens of reproducibility. <clears throat> and um, we all heard about the reproducibility crisis. I won't go into that. I think that there are some misconceptions about what exactly that means. Um, so I'll do my best to explain what we mean by reproducibility and how we try to, um, to uh, work with it. So the CURE Consortium um, started a few years back. It uh, really started from a chance meeting at a conference where several of us realized that we are doing work that is very similar and we, that we haven't seen done anywhere else. And the work was uh, and is um, to support the curation of research data and code um, in order to facilitate uh, the publication and the preservation and the reproducibility of a complete scientific record. Um, so we're really interested in uh, the, the reproducibility of scientific claims as they are reported in our journals um, and, of, uh, and interested in taking care of the underlying uh, artifacts or materials, research outputs, that um, make up these claims that that are the foundation for these for these claims. Um, so uh, three of us uh, started the consortium. Uh, we've kind of been doing it, you know, on a volunteer basis, um, but have been trying to grow the network uh, to expand to other um, groups, as I will explain. Two of us were trained in the disciplines, so we come from background of social science research. And one of us was trained in um, library and information science and has a background in archiving. And that combination was really great because we found ourselves all working uh, to share data and code and make it available, but having to learn all about the infrastructure and the policies and the technology that goes into it um, in order to make it um, uh, available in the way that we thought was, uh, was important. So what we try to do is share our practices. We try to work on establishing some standards in this area, and we try to promote uh, what we call the data quality review, um, which I will explain as well. So uh, let's spend a minute on um, definitions. So this is from the National Academies of Science, Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine in the United States in 2019. Um, where they define reproducibility as the ability to uh, obtain consistent results using the same data, the same computational steps, methods, and codes, um, and conditions of analysis. So really reproducibility means computational reproducibility. It makes sense this day and age, everybody uses computation uh, in one way or another, and those steps can be uh, repeated and should be reproducible for anyone using a particular data set to reach particular um, claims, particular results. So we, uh, we base ourselves on, on that definition. So first, as uh, you know, the use of data repositories is increasing. So I've heard before uh, today um, you know, about uh, references to other journals, databases, repositories. So this is just one figure. I could show other uh, sources uh, that show something similar, but this is from um, uh, RE3 data um, and the number of references to their um, uh, resource, which is a global directory of, of repositories. So it, it, you could see the large increase um, and there's a, com a, a similar increase, of course, in use. We think that this is a significant and very important step forward in terms of addressing the first part of FAIR 
findability and accessibility. It's fantastic and we're very happy about that. We do have some questions about the interoperability and the reusability through when we're thinking about this through the lens of reproducibility. So the question that we're trying to address is, you know, how do we make sure that what is deposited is of high quality? So it's great that we have these repositories, journals are having these policies, people are um, obliging uh, in various degrees. Sometimes they have to because they can't publish without it. Um, but how do we know what it is that's in these repositories and can we reproduce these results that have been um, published? And what we are, what I want to focus for a minute on the word quality, um, you know, people talk about data quality. Um, there's a lot of ways to think about data quality. Um, and we kind of distinguish that um, conversation from how we view quality, which is really the idea that you should be able, any user should be able to independently understand and reuse the materials in the long term. So this is based on Gary King's um, article from 1995. This is a long time ago called uh, Replication, Replication. And the idea that you shouldn't have to go back to the author to say, what did you mean by this? And how exactly did you do that? Because authors are not going to be around forever. And we are spending a lot of resources on documenting and archiving and preserving their materials. They should be used. Um, to the best extent possible. So we want uh, obviously access to data, but we also want the ability to independently and intelligently use these data and the code. So first, what do we are uh, what when we're talking about curating for reproducibility, what are we curating? Um, what we're really talking about is a, a research compendium or a reproducible file bundle. So this is from the uh, Turing Way. Um, and it's just an illustration of the minimum sorts of uh, things that will go into a research compendium. It includes the data, of course, but it could also include code, description, readme files, other figures. Maybe there's a container, maybe there's a, a make file, other sorts of things. And we take that as a whole and think about how do we curate the whole as well as the component parts. So when also in terms of definitions, um, when we talk about curation, just to be clear, I think I don't need to explain to this audience, but of course, we're talking about uh, the management and the preservation of digital materials uh, over time. It's a set of actions that we take um, over time to ensure access and um, uh, usability and preservation. We are firm believers that um, the best time to curate is before publication. So I just want to take a nod for a minute, um, nod to um, some conversations that are going on about peer review of reproducibility. We think that that's important, but it serves a slightly different function. Um, that's a, that is assuming already that the materials are usable. Um, if, if the community at large can go in and review these materials and say, you know, we don't think you use the right method, or this analysis is wrong, um, or you miss something here, that's a, a conversation for the scientific community. What we're talking about is before things are published or archived and made available, um, that there is some kind of technical um, uh, review and assessment. So... Why do we curate? We curate to enable this continued access to ensure that there's computational reproducibility and that um, the objects meet the standards of FAIR. So when we think about curation, the gold standard of curation in archives um, has always uh, consistent, and I'm thinking of big national archives and institutions uh, in the United States like um, ICPSR, um, institutions like the UK Data Archive, uh, the goal, they do very high level of data curation. They go all the way down to the variable level. Um, they include the files, they include the documentation and metadata, and they look at the data itself. Um, and those are actions that we take, um, uh, that we have also implemented as far um, as the CURE Consortium is concerned. What we add to the picture is the idea of code review. Um, in general, what we mean by code review is to assess the purpose of the code. Is this a code that is recoding variables? Is it manipulating and testing data? 
Is it analysis code? What is this code? How is it used? And then does the code, can we use the code to accomplish these goals? So what that means is that we want to verify that the code can be executed. Can we run it? And then when we run it, does it do what it purported to do? Does it achieve these results or does it do the thing it's meant to do? So I could tell you from experience that a lot of the things that we um, find and end up uh, having to deal with is um, problems with code not being executable for various reasons. So one of the main reasons is various packages that are out of date or um, unavailable. Um, and so we need to have better documentation about what is required to make the code run. Um, we have even more simple problems like um, uh, people having uh, not using the best practices when, when writing code. So using um, absolute file paths, for example, <laughs> pointing back to their own directories instead of using relative file paths. And these things make it difficult for someone else to run the code. So these are the kinds of things that, that we do. And in the process of doing that, um, we believe that we're also extending the um, and applying um, more fair, more fair data and more fair code. So just really quickly about a couple of things that we've done as a group um, in the last couple of years where we have worked within RDA um, on the Cure Fair working group. Um, and one of the outputs that we've done uh, there, uh, identifying the fact that there isn't really a standard way to do this work and there isn't really a standard um, uh, consistent uh, workflow for this kind of work. Um, we, we created the 10 things for curating reproducible and fair code. This is available um, through the uh, RDA. Um, it's also on Zenodo. And we also have um, a, a website uh, curating for reproducibility.org, um, where you can see it, it, there's a little bit of an easy to use, easier to use um, format for um, uh, accessing this information. So we have 10 things. These we, we consider these high-level principles that you need to uh, comply with or think about, keep in mind when you're doing this work. Um, each of them um, is modular, so uh, they could be um, they could be changed. Um, we also have a GitHub where people can fork this and kind of adapt it to their own discipline. Um, and within each of these things, we have levels. You can get the basic idea by getting started. You can go a little deeper um, to the level of learn more and then even deeper um, where you get more resources and more, more information. Uh, these uh, principles were adopted by several organizations so far, and um, we have materials on the website, and we'll be adding more materials to show how, how exactly that's been doing. The other thing that the CURE Consortium has been working on with funding from IMLS is training for librarians. So here we have um, four lessons that we've created. They're also uh, available right now. Um, they're kind of in beta form, but they're in pretty good shape. Um, they should be, um, we, we are hopeful, they're, they're using the library carpentry format and we're hoping that they will be added to the library carpentry curriculum for librarians on how to do this work. So there's a lesson introducing the idea of data curation for reproducibility, um, workflows, various workflows, how do you do the reproducibility assessment, um, and then issues of packaging and publication, um, which could be um, interesting to, to this group here. Um, yes, so about the uh, consortium itself, um, as I mentioned, there are three of us who started it. And what's interesting here is that we, as I said, we we realize we're doing similar processes, but we have different sort of clients um, or customers, I guess, um, and different motivations. So um, at UNC, uh, the Odom Institute at the University of North Carolina, they contracted with several journals to do uh, replication um, for their for their studies. And, and again, the terms replication here is um, interchangeable, but it's basically curating for reproducibility. And I'll show a little bit more about what that means. At the Cornell Center for Social Science, they have their own data archive, and they decided that they want to pr uh, provide services for anyone who wants to archive there to do these sort of um, checks and verifications. And for us at the uh, at Yale's Institution for Social and Policy Studies, 
Um, it's fairly similar. We have our own small data archive, and we wanted to make sure that we align our curation workflows with um, the higher uh, standards of the data quality review. So because this is a, 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 a day to talk about uh, journals and, and publications, I want to focus on what UNC is doing because it's the most, the most relevant here. So here's an example of what they produce at the end. So they're working with a journal called State Politics and Policy Quarterly. Um, they're using their Dataverse. Um, the journal will publish um, an article, um, and then they will publish a verified replication package in Dataverse that the Odom Institute has done um, all the checking to ensure that um, data is curated to the highest extent possible and also verify that the code can run and that the code actually uh, produces the, uh, the results that were reported in the article. Um, the American Journal of Political Science is another journal that Odom Institute is working with. Um, and um, I, I put a little snippet here of their um, verification policy. So we see that more and more journals are now having, um, I don't know if more and more, but we start, we're starting to see that some journals are requiring this kind of uh, verification, um, not just depositing data, not just depositing code, but also somewhere in the publication workflow, there is a step that um, is actually working with the data, working with the code to make sure that what we have here is indeed producing the results in the article. So uh, this is interesting because I mentioned the uh, National Academies of Science, Engineering, Medicine report, and they do have a recommendation here for journals to exactly do this sort of work. Journals should consider, consider ways to ensure computational reproducibility. Um, this is a recommendation by the group that wrote this report where it, I think it's yet to be seen how exactly the landscape and the ecosystem organizes itself to support this recommendation. I think there's a lot of questions. I'm sure you all have some about who's going to do this work and how is it going to be funded and how is it going to be supported, but I think we're going in that direction. Um, so this is a key report that um, made this recommendation. And we also have from the European Commission a recommendation um, that journals, uh, you know, that 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 especially publishers should encourage peer review of data, code, software, especially at the publication stage. So, um, even though this report right here found um, that um, about half of the journal editors say that their journal is implementing measures to enhance reproducibility. So about half said that that they're not. Um, but um, but again, given the context of this report and the way that I think things are headed, I think that we're going to get there. So I just want to quickly um, uh, move to uh, very quickly just to kind of show you how the for all of them how they have the um, process integrated into the manuscript um, publication. Uh, workflow. So after someone submits an article and there's a conditional acceptance, they are required to uh, submit their data and code. That goes through the curation and verification. And only after curation and verification are approved, there's a final exception and, and uh, acceptance and publication. We abstracted that um, workflow and also wrote a paper about um, uh, uh, canonical workflow for, for publication, because we do think that that is something that could be um, used um, in, in other places. And um, like I mentioned, there are other players who are um, picking up on this idea. Uh, the American Economics Association has a data editor and all of their journals now um, institute th these procedures to uh, review the data and the code and verify reproducibility. And there are other uh, groups. These are not um, formally associated with the CURE Consortium, but they're doing similar work. Cascade in France, CodeCheck is another, um, another initiative. So just to kind of bring it back to the idea of uh, quality that we started with, what does it mean quality? Um, how do we ensure quality? Um, 
we can make the argument that one way to know that something uh, that 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 it has high quality is if we can actually reproduce it. And so without having this uh, these materials and without being able to verify, we won't know um, if we're having uh, something of high quality or not. So I think I'm at time. I will stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Limor. It was very interesting for me. And we have uh, you one uh, comment and one question for you in a chat. Uh, so the first uh, first comment is about research software engineers being interested in software archiving slash versioning slash preservation. And so our colleague Allison provided a link to uh, society web page uh, and she said that they also have Slack workspace so she's recommended that you and we all we uh, have a look at uh, at, at what they are doing so this is interesting and uh... Uh, thank you Alison I just want to mention thank you that's absolutely um, uh, great and thank you for sending the link there's a group in uh, Australia the Australian Research Data Center um, uh, that is also pushing and working on this and we've uh, one of uh, their folks Tom Honeyman is also co-chair of our cure fair uh, working group at RDA so yes absolutely there is a, a meshing uh, uh, you know increasing uh, connection between data people code people, software people, um, which I think is is the way it's going to continue. Absolutely. I mean, I went to the RSE conference this year because it was close and I had some of my colleagues who are RSEs I was backing up. And it was amazing just how much of our work as data scientists are actually follows under research software engineering and how much they've already thought about. And I know there's some some people and projects you've mentioned in your talk are people I saw represented at RSE. So I know there must be some connections already. The Software Sustainability Institute is big in the RSE as well. So I think that there's already, as you say, there's connections and we probably already are connected on some level, but there was a big section of talks on software preservation. So it might be worth it. Thank you. Thanks. So now we are already slightly in this general discussion part, but if I may tackle just this last question for Limor. Uh, so it's um, so it's thanking you for uh, emphasizing the importance of code review when it comes to ensuring long term reproducibility. Um, the person said, I also very much enjoy the research code management workshop that you guys held at EASIST. Me too. It was very, uh, yeah, it was a very nice introduction in what you are doing. With, so we had also practical exercises there. Uh, I assume that many RDM support organizations lack the technical expertise to be able to perform code review in many cases, especially when it comes to niche types of project uh, hardware development, for instance. Uh, how do you suggest that RDM support organizations go about acquiring the skills needed, hiring developers or in-house training? I have some thoughts about that, and I don't know if they're going to add up to a satisfactory <laughs> answer. I think the training uh, is important, and that's part of why we created the curriculum. This is a curriculum for data librarians primarily and other data professionals. So we think that we can tap into a whole um, area of data librarianship to upskill them a little bit, uh, people who are working with repositories and are doing curation um, to understand to do some basic code review along these lines. So I would say training is one answer. I think that technology is going to be another answer. I think that at some point we'll be able to do these kind of uh, reviews more automatically. Um, and that, that will also re uh, relieve some of the burden. Um, I think that uh, in-house, so I think that, I guess the third part of this is the researchers themselves. And that also will mean some education and some awareness. Um, I, I always say that as uh, data curators and RDM people, um, in some ways, our job, our goal is to be obsolete. 
Our goal is to not be needed <laughs> because the materials that we get are of high quality and they, they check all the boxes of what we need from the researchers in the first place. And then, and then it's pretty easy to just do these kind of reviews. Um, so I think it's going to take some time. I think the I think we're going to see some developments along these lines, but I think um, a good starting point is um, is training. And I guess the last point I'll make is that uh, social sciences are not exactly organized in labs so much, but we do have research centers that that sit closer to the researchers, closer, I mean, than say the library, which which serves the entire institution. So they have a little bit more uh, domain knowledge and they can also be a source of this kind of support. Yeah, thank you, Limor. And so now we have 10 more minutes for a general discussion. Our colleague Yanis can moderate Hello. it. Yeah. Hello, Please, can, Yanis, I, can I jump over. in <laughs> to, to moderate? We share, we share our, our efforts in moderating. And uh, well, uh, everyone is invited to um, um, to to say something. Uh, we, we are especially interested as a project uh, that runs under the CESDA. What would be uh, some uh, suggestions for uh, service providers for CESDA? Where to put emphasis? What to develop in in order to. Uh, better support journals, authors, and uh, other users. And uh, so feel free to just uh, raise hand. Uh, perhaps we can start uh, already with the Peter Dorn question, or maybe Peter, would you, would you like to elaborate a bit on it? Uh, you you post this uh, already at the beginning uh, as a challenge for for the uh says the data archives uh regarding uh how to deal with different types of uh data you know peter are, are you still there or he's on the call <laughs> yeah he's sorry yeah i am i was there but i was just my can you repeat the question because I okay I I, I just wanted to to uh, uh, leave you uh, an opportunity to to uh, elaborate your question that you put uh, put at the the beginning, uh, at the beginning. regarding the uh, type of uh, yes. the data that we are dealing with yes yes um, so. Um, the question was about um, uh, supplementary materials that are um, um, often stored, uh, well, not, not so often, I think, in social science data archives, but very often in, in general repositories, such as Figshare or Zenodo or Mendeley data, and you name it. Uh, but they are also stored um, sometimes at social science data archives. And my question is, um, whether it is, I, I think it is very important to distinguish between that type of data, which is usually relatively small uh, amounts, as they are, let us say, the figures of a table, uh, yeah, the numbers of a, of a table, or the the figures behind a, a, a graph, or something like that, which is quite different from the base data set on which the original research is is based. So the source data. And um, uh, because it struck me that sometimes those those general purpose repositories, they are very big. They have hundreds of thousands of data sets, but they are very, they, they, that's quite different from the, the smaller numbers, but for much bigger data sets that we often have in the social science data archives. And if we do not distinguish between the types, then it becomes rather blurry what the type of data is that we actually have in the archives and it makes it also very hard to compare them and i was wondering whether in social science data archives that are accepting the kind of supplementary data whether which type of data the core data sets from the source data sets okay if, if they don't whether we shouldn't 
Is, is there anyone want to com comment on this? Uh, because I mean, says the service providers are actually some of them are are adapting their services to the reality of uh, what what uh, what are the as you said the supplementary data material from from uh, connected to research articles is there anyone to want to comment brian please yeah just to say that we had a long reflection about this question about treating data related to publications in a different way than we treat our usual um, data, full data sets, they, how we, this is how we call them within our archive. Um, and so um, one result of this is that we concluded that these really do need to be distinguished in terms of the metadata, in terms of the checking, the controls, um, in terms of our conditions for what we accept. And so um, after a long reflection, we decided to uh, to create a separate service even for replication data and materials, something uh, apart from our ordinary, you know, usual data archive. And I know that there are other data archives for the social sciences that have made the same choice for some of the same reasons. So I think it's an important reflection to have and that you have to be careful not to um, um, mix those things too much. But it's a long this I mean debate. I mean this yeah. yeah yes. So maybe is is there from from the uh, audience or or from from the presenters uh, are there any thought uh, about this dilemma if you can say so uh, regarding uh, you know um, at the beginning uh, already Seraphim presented uh, that says the archives they have a mission for long-term preservation for for uh, assessing data quality to correlate data intensively and uh now i mean may, maybe all also naively uh our group or at least for for myself I, I i would say when when uh considering uh this uh promotion of services to journalists uh, i had a feeling we already accept data and we want to accept data of good quality and of reuse a reuse potential but uh i mean uh, when when we see the reality of uh, the the different kinds of data that comes uh, out are are these certain data even past the minimal criteria that that we have uh you know to accept data in the repository and so uh, uh, is there anyone who wants to comment on this I mean, like, like it's also it's also a question of uh, uh, the uh, some of you talked about the review, or many of you mentioned the the the, uh, the peer review, and uh, is there you know uh, is there a role for for the service providers for says the repositories to actually uh, do part of the data review instead of the uh, journals uh, reviewers and uh, would this be something uh, tractable for the for the journals for the um, publishers yes U Ulbe, would well yes Josh. i think we heard different things um so let's say the technicalities of the metadata. We have the, the code books and the reproducibility, computer, computational reproducibility of data. I'm a historian, I also think about the, the, the problem of provenance of you know, the data, how reliable are they? So I think that you need to distinguish between different uh, ways of assessing quality and that different spheres have their own role in this. And for this reason, I, I found it so important that we have this uh, data journal because in the data journal, we are looking at this issue of provenance from a domain perspective. And others 
can look at the, the reproducibility. And that's, that's another thing, because that's the way how the, the codes are uh, designed, how the correlations are designed, how the regressions are designed, etc., etc. So I think we need to distinguish between different spheres and domains and see how we can create the, the optimum uh, synergy. That would be my suggestion. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Peter, would you, would you like to-, to Yeah, when, when um, Lane Breuer and I were uh, editing the uh, research data journal a couple of years ago, um, we also paid a lot of attention to the data reviews uh, but it was a bit of a wrestle actually to to get that done in principle it is it is it is feasible but um you you could distinguish between the more formal kind of um evaluation uh, things like uh, is the data in a repository and um uh, and, and for instance in a in a uh, in a um, trustworthy repository if it is then already more or less automatically uh, care is taken about a couple of the the, the formal or even fair uh, characteristics like thing, things like um, um, the presence of a persistent identifier and, and stuff like that. Um, so part of that has been covered. And also those formal characteristics, they can even now more or less automatically be checked. There is a couple of uh, fair um evaluators that perform the task uh, automatically but they cannot check everything uh, and especially the more qualitative aspects of quality if i <laughs> if i may express it like that it's it's of course um, um not so easy and um uh, even here um like uh, like with other quality um uh, elements uh, there is always an ele uh, a part of it is subjective and um, and therefore also hard to um, let us say to 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 uh, um, to give a very very hard criterion on. But of course, the same is true with the quality of papers or how should I say articles and books themselves. Uh, also there, well, the review is often has these qualitative uh, elements, but still the that's why we have peer review we have others that give their opinion on the on the validity and the reliability and the quality of the of what has been done and i think that in principle it is possible but it is difficult to do and it requires also special skills to to do it um and um yeah ultimately um uh when we're talking about a data set um the proof is probably only when you do a reanalysis or have comparable data sets that you can establish uh, the quality and how far is it realistically that you that you can go there. So um, uh, perhaps for the time being, we should be uh, satisfied with at least a kind of a formal criteria that um, uh, the data set is in a trustworthy environment, is ac uh, accessible and, 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 and so on before we can uh, has a particular format that can be reused and so on um and uh, and meanwhile uh, see uh, how far we can get with the qualitative uh, elements in my previous presentation for this group i did refer to uh, a form that we developed for this to have a kind of an, uh, a list a, a checklist uh, in which an evaluator goes through the data set and uh, let us say checks whether those elements are there, but whether they truly capture the quality, hmm. hard to say. Yes, yes, it's it's interesting. I mean, also this idea of uh, this uh, uh, repository uh, uh, or publishing platform that that was presented uh, that actually keeps the the reviews public. Mm -hmm. And something uh, similar maybe uh, could be established for the data sets that the people who reuse the data set then uh, actually observe some, you know, good and uh, difficult uh, aspects of, of data sets if there are maybe wrong descriptions or errors in the, you know, if, I, if we go to this basic uh, level. 
Uh, but maybe we, we, we can maybe just accept uh, the, the, the last question because it's, it's, we are already uh, running uh, out of time. Mariana, you want to add something? Uh, yeah, I, I just wanted to relate this uh, data quality review to what uh, actually Limor was uh, presenting. So this is, this for me at least, this uh, presentation showed that this is possible to uh, organize such kind of uh, service. And so it's not just possible, it's there. They, they already have it. Uh, so I think it's very valuable to, to look what they are doing to, to, to share some experiences. And this was basically the motivation why we invited Limor here. Uh, so yeah. it's, it, is, yes. it is for sure possible that so just, just uh, we have sure, to think sure, about. Sure. I'm not sure if anybody in Europe is doing this yet. Uh, but I mean, as, sure as, as they Limor, are, Limor they said, that, that there, are, there are different aspects mm. of quality and so yeah. this uh, relate, relation to the reproducibility, it's actually only one one angle you can tackle this. Mm. Uh, but uh, maybe maybe we just need to conclude. Uh, would you, Seraphim, like to say some final words uh, for evaluating the event or anything else? Yes, can you hear me now? Yes, excellent. Okay, well, first of all, I, I am fascinated by the presentations and would like to thank our presenters um, joining us. I thoroughly enjoyed the presentations and the discussion. I wish we had more time for the discussion, but uh, this is how it always works out. We run out of time. Um, and uh, also, I would like to thank my colleagues from the various uh, service providers around Europe for supporting um, this effort, as I said, it's not me, it's a, a teamwork um, going forward with this. And we will contact various service providers for profiles, as I mentioned earlier, that will appear on the website. And the website is here on the chat, and we will keep updating it. And also, please join the mailing list that I mentioned earlier, if you're not a member already. And um, we've been holding back relatively with discussions, but now that we have enough a critical mass, we will start exchanging views and continue this discussion there. And uh, that's all from me for now. Uh, all the material from this event will become available.